on the cover, a cosy diner emblazoned with the name Kirby's sits between two apartment buildings. In the window of the diner, we can see infantry seated at a booth with a handsome young man in suspenders. Across from them, Lady Goliath sips a cup of coffee. On the fire escape to the left, we see Eliza Highwire peering down the adjoining alleyway with intense curiosity and a mischievous grin. To the right, the trench-coated form of the Silence swings into a window with fluttering pastel curtains. The caption reads, What secrets will be revealed? What hearts will be broken? What monsters await our heroes? Find out in this issue of Hindsight's Gold Age, Time's Looming Shadow. Welcome back to the Gold Era. It's been a hell of a time. Uh, so to recap, we've got three, count them, three heroes with us. We've got Infantry, uh, The Silence, and Highwire. And we just had a fight with a giant dust monster that uh, kind of sprang up from the corpse of a really ancient Professor Paradox. Uh, the younger version of which has now skedaddled. But up in the sky, we've got Axiom, who is very swiftly coming down towards the rest of our kids and we've got god i wanted to call her olivia she's not she's lady goliath who is coming in from the side so first question as axiom touches down in the middle of this big circus uh with this floating huge emerald in the middle and kind of eyes the three of you up what do you do so um just just to refresh my memory really quick because I'm not 100% firing on all, all cylinders right now. Axiom is ostensibly one of the good guys, right? Yes, yes. He's, he's on our side. Uh yeah, the the silence is going to pop a forearm up and do like a little wave. Cool. I think he I think he kind of like gives you like a little bit of an eye and then kind of like a little a little salute sort of thing uh, because he is very much a military sort of hero in the vein of like a Captain America at this point in time. Gotcha. And he comes down and basically, I think he's just going to straight up ignore Eliza because you're just kidding a leotard at this point to him. He does give a glance over to infantry, and I think we get a couple of panels around the two of them. And I think what that looks like is, first off, infantry, what is the expression on your face when you see, you know, Axiom probably for the first time in uh, at least like a year? I think infantry is trying not to look at him. And when he does, his eyes are narrowed ever so slightly. Like, it's a very restrained sort of... Not dislike, but there's definitely something there that he's trying not to show. Okay. And I think on Axiom's end, we get kind of a similar look where he's got like the kind of like narrowed eyes, but maybe not like... More like a, huh, kind of like this guy's here. And around the two of them, we get a series of panels from Infantry's perspective inside a large bomber plane. We see a bomb being dropped, and we see it stop in midair, blow apart into its component pieces, and then just fly up into the sky. We see the form of the sentry, who is a golden glowing mass of plasma in a vaguely humanoid shape. We see Axiom rushing towards that shape, and then we see a giant nuclear mushroom cloud. And then we come back uh, into real time, as Axiom kind of sidesteps the two of you and heads over to eye this emerald and sort of directs towards just the room in general. So what happened here exactly? The circus is all about the unexpected. And I think he kind of looks over his shoulder at you. Hi, Eliza Highwire, star of The Greatest Show on Earth. Anyway, a giant uh, tornado thing? Um... Destroyed the circus and exploded into an emerald. And he looks back and he reaches out a hand, because this thing is still just kind of hovering in midair. And he reaches out a hand to try and grab it. And as he does, there's a crackle of electricity and it just kind of like blows him a few feet back. He looks very surprised by this. And at this point, uh, Lady Goliath is kind of entering uh, from the other side, claps infantry on the back. Uh, kind of looks around at the rest of you. Goes, oh wow, you you kids did a great job in here. Look at that, no casualties at all. And uh, Axiom sort of looks back over at her, and there's that very tense, narrowed-eyed moment of maybe these two don't like each other. And she just sort of brushes past towards. I think at this point, the silence is still kind of in the middle of a of a bunch of stands. And she kind of heads over in that direction. It's like, oh, are you okay? You look you look like you got beat up something terrible. 
the silence shakes his head really, really rapidly and does like a nah, don't worry about it kind of motion. And then a, an okay sign. And she kind of like nods at you and goes, no, okay, I strong silent type. I get that. And she looks over at Axiom. Double thumbs up. I really appreciate that. <laughs> uh, Axiom like turns his head and like kind of like stalks off a little bit. The two of them head over towards the side and they seem to be having words at each other rather than with each other. There's definitely an argument going on. What are the three of you doing at this point? The silence is still kind of hanging back in the stands. He's definitely sort of hedging his bets between, like, if he's going to stay or if he's going to go. Well, I, I, I just wanted to say thank you both for helping to save the circus. And um, I'd love to give you both a complimentary... Uh, season passes to go to the circus and also um mr the silence um uh, are you um are you doing anything after this the the silence is sort of like rubbing the back of his head in like sort of a, a almost bashful way yes 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 i'm i'm asking you out on a date the silence uh the the silence looks at high wire and has like the the big the big circle eyes with like the the three sweat drops like jumping off of the head, exasperated anime style, and sort of like shakes his head and like shakes his his hands like no thank you. Oh, ouch! Oh, shot down. Sorry, Highwire. Oh, you could you can never love the person behind the man, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you can. That remains to be seen. We don't have we're too early in the arc for a dramatic reveal yet. Well. You're you're still welcome to take a season season pass if you'd like. Are you holding out a season pass? Sure. Uh, the silence contemplates the season pass and then uh takes it pinky up and withdraws it. So how about infantry? Uh what what's you up to in the aftermath of this? Well, at first he is pretty much just straight third wheeling on high wire and silence, but as that situation gets a little more awkward He's going to deny the season passes. With all due respect, ma'am, it's all part of a day's work. I can't... I feel weird taking any sort of extra payment. And he's going to basically about face and try to see how close he can get to Lady Goliath and Axiom to hopefully overhear what they're saying without being conspicuous. Okay. Uh, so as you come up, they are having an argument, to put it very bluntly, about the sentry. Lady Goliath thinks that the sentry could probably contain whatever this thing is and get it out of here. And Axiom is very much of the opinion that this is on U.S. soil and it belongs to the U.S. military now. That's what the argument is about. So just sort of knowledge that infantry would have. Would this be something that he would feel comfortable stepping into? Or is Lady Goliath more of the stay out of it, you don't have that sort of clearance type of leader? Uh, no, she is a very um, supportive kind of leader. So if this is a thing that you have an expertise on and that you have a valid opinion on, she is never going to stop you from speaking that. She'll probably back you up if you do. Well, I don't know how valid it is, but Infantry sure has an opinion. <laughs> Hell yeah. He sort of steps up behind him. With all due respect, Axiom, we don't exactly know what we're dealing with here. It doesn't seem very fair to be trusting it in the hands of one government. Uh, and I think the way he responds to that is that he sort of, like, turns around and for, for just a second, like, holds up a hand at Lady Goliath, and you can, you can see that she is very offended at this. But he turns at you and he goes, and I don't think that we should put it in the hands of some alien from God knows where who has no allegiance to anyone. And frankly, neither of you is in your jurisdiction, so I don't see how you get a say here. And with that, Let's take a quick pan uh, back over to Highwire in the silence, where something slightly less tense is happening. <laughs> the silence is watching this exchange that just happened with infantry and the, the two adults, and he just has like this kind of ooh look on his face. He doesn't have like a dog in this fight, so he's half half listening in to try to figure out exactly what happened here, but also just kind of interested in like what the the authorities actually want to do with this this chaos emerald, if you will. Sure, sure. Uh, I, I'm just listing all the things that you can do at the circus, <laughs> <laughs> like just out loud uh, to the silence, or just in general. And, and elephants, and elephants, and acrobats, and horses, and dogs, and a clown, 
and and we sell popcorn and there's like candy a, floss. There's like a solid two panels of the silence watching infantry sort of get shot down by the adults. And while he's watching this um, in the background, it's just a speech bubble of a high lady wire, with a snake of high wire listing out all magicians. the things you can do with the circus. There's jugglers. I forget anything else you can do with the circus, but I, I'm pretty An sure. An interpretive dance performance <laughs> of Moby Dick. I'm like 99% sure jugglers fig- figure in like really big in the circus. Jugglers, contact jugglers, <laughs> David Bowie in the labyrinth. <laughs> so so let's so let's get back over infantry. Uh, so that just happened. How do you respond? Or do you respond? Oh, I'm sorry. Have I not screwed up enough international incidents to have an opinion yet? He, he like, just frowns at you, and he, like, points a finger, like, right into your chest, like he's about to really rip into you, uh, and Goliath grabs his arm and just forces it away from you, looks over at you, Roger, thank you very much, we will talk later, and then she looks over at infant, uh, she looks over at Axiom, you, me, outside, right now, and she hauls him out of the tent, which does leave the three of you alone in here for a moment. You can hear, uh, sirens, you can hear ambulances, uh, you can you you know that there's someone coming at this point. Uh, well, the the silence goes up to infantry and offers his hand to like like a handshake, like a pleased to meet you sort of thing. Yeah, infantry does the uh, not sure if it's military specific, but like the deep hand where you like grab each other by the forearms instead of handshaking. Oh, I call that bro grabs. Yeah, I yeah. love that. Infantry bro grabs the silence. Who is clearly oh, are we taken off guard by it, but is also like after half a second, like, okay, we can shake like this. Oh, are we joining up? Are we forming a team? Are we going to investigate what's going on? There's a slightly heavy sigh from infantry as he looks over at Highwire and says, we seem to work well enough together. I don't see why not. Nice. And I like that as kind of a panel to sort of uh, end that particular scene on. We are going to flash forward a couple of days. And in those couple of days, I want to get some very brief solo moments with people. And I want to start uh, with the silence. So this is you getting home, probably later that night, or maybe even close to morning. I'm going to leave that up to you. Yes, hot dog. That's exactly what I was hoping for. Uh, The cat has also joined me. I will try to keep him polite. That's that's, that's fine. You You just have a house cat in character. It's fine. They probably do. They probably have like a tabby cat or something running around to like take care of mice and bugs. Yeah, the silence gets home probably pretty late, like... Midnight-ish? I do want to ask, when you get home, um, you do have a sibling, and David is awake, and I was actually just going to see if you could tell me a little bit about him. Yeah, so um, I think what happens is, um, first, we get the interior shot of a bedroom that's, you know, it's it's nighttime, so there's like a couple of lights, maybe from like the street lights outside, slanting into the room. It's very clearly a woman's room. There's like the vanity with like all of the the beauty products and stuff on there. There's like a closet that's open with like a couple of dresses. And um, we see the window open from outside. And then we see the silence throw his leg into the window and sort of like climb into the room. And um, we see him take off his coat and we see him take off his hat. And as he takes off his coat, we see that the coat adds like a considerable amount of bulk to him. Like when after he takes it off, we can kind of see that his frame is actually like kind of slight under there. Um, The hat comes off and the shoes come off and we realize that the silence is actually like shorter than he comes across in the initial drawings of him on the panel. And then he sort of leans down in front of the vanity and we see him reach onto his face and pull the mask off. And staring into the mirror is the face of a young woman and she's got dark hair and dark eyes and um, her her lip is pretty roughed up. She um, she looks like she might have the beginnings of a black eye going on. And uh, she looks into the mirror and she says, Well, Norma, you really did a number on yourself this time, huh? And, uh, and, I, and I like that as kind of from the doorway, you kind of hear someone like clear their throat. And I, and I like that as an intro for David there. I think he's got probably like a nice mug of either like hot tea or hot chocolate or just something like whatever Norma would prefer there. And he's been waiting up for you to get home. Yeah. And uh, Norma is wearing like the, still the men's shirt tucked into the trousers. She um, sort of slides her suspenders off her shoulders. So they're kind of dangling around her, uh, her, her knees. 
and she like very very quietly opens the door and like sticks her her head out and makes sure that their dad's gone to bed and then she sneaks down the hallway and goes into david's room and david is sitting there with the the mug of tea Mm -hmm. and as you enter obviously you know they're kind of like like dash lined voice bubbles to show that people are being quiet right and he's like geez you got real banged up tonight yeah today was uh kind of a real humdinger (laughs) finally now i get to talk i should have my page of 1940s slang up. <laughs> yes. Finally. So yeah, um, Norma sits down on David's bed and she takes the, the mug of tea and, you know, she starts sort of recounting what happened. She was out in the uh, the streets, you know, busting up some chrome domes who were trying to, to steal from the, the jeweler. And she met up with uh, another superhero named Infantry and they wound up going to the circus and there was this whole thing where like, there's this big old Sandman who like exploded and turned into an emerald. And then like, you know, the, the army showed up and there was another girl there who was in the circus and God, God love her, but she's got a thing for the silence. So we got to I got to watch out for that one. And, you know, she, she's going through all of this stuff. And then, you know, she, uh, she snuck out and she came home. Nice. And I think, I think David is very, very like wrapped um, on, on really everything that you're telling him here, because this is, as big a thrill for him, maybe, as it is for you. Maybe more because he's not actively getting hurt. Yeah, he has he has nondescript 1940s wasting disease, so he can't really get out and do a lot of heroing. But what he does do for you, he's actually got something that he's been working on. Because while he can't physically go out there, he can at least keep an eye on, like, the newspapers and see, you know, leads for the silence to get into. Yeah. Uh, so he's got a big like folding cardboard kind of uh, mock-up with a bunch of newspaper clippings on it. And they all point to this gallery opening that's happening uh, later this week for the Walter Gibson collection uh, featuring the Byzantium clock. And he's basically got a lot of stuff circled that like a bunch of criminals that have been doing petty crimes around the area have been captured. And a lot of them have ties to Professor Paradox. And this is like a clock thing. And that's like his thing. So David is very interested to see if you think that this might be worth looking into. Yeah, uh, Norma sees the, oh my, oh my gosh, I love David. (laughs) Immediately, immediately (laughs) endeared to my, my podcast brother. Norma looks at, she goes, oh my God, Davey. This, this this is the guy that they were talking about in the circus tent, Professor Paradox. And he's like, really? What were they saying about him? Well, I think that he showed up before he exploded into sand. Wait, he's... He ex- but then he was there again, but younger. He, 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 can, he can time travel, right? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Jesus is the kind of dope that the other two are going to need to know about. I want to I wanna move over right quick to infantry. So... This is a couple of days after uh, your fight at the circus, and Lady Goliath has kind of taken you out uh, for like a late lunch, like one, two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, And she is uh, very much about her people's personal lives, so she is taking out both you and William. And this is a diner called Kirby's. And right quick, Roger, what are you having at Kirby's? What level of diner are we talking about here? Is this... Is this like a sit-down place or like a... Yeah, yeah, this is like a sit-down diner. Okay, uh, I don't know. Roger's probably pretty simple. He doesn't go, like, too high-end. He's probably... I don't know. I was not expecting this to be a question I'd have to answer. (laughs) He gets, like, a burger and fries. It's a pastrami. simple like that. Very all-American, simple... I've said simple way too many times. It doesn't sound like a real word anymore. Very simple. So you have your burger, your fries. William, I think, uh, probably has something similar and like a milkshake. Lady Goliath in her plain clothes still sticks out because, as mentioned, she is goddamn huge. She is a very buff lady. And she's got a big stack of pancakes and a cup of coffee. Most of this has been small talk about like, you know, your life, uh, what's been going on with you personally. So what are Roger's plans for the future at this point? I don't think Roger really has a whole lot of plans. He's very much still trying to come to terms with the fact that he was basically taken in by Cleo to basically be the quote-unquote weapon that stops the war. And so, like, now that the war is over, he's sort of lost. Like, he will admit to Lady Goliath and William, and probably not many other people, 
that he feels pretty directionless. Yeah, yeah. And uh and I think I think LG kind of picks up on that. Like she definitely knows that there's something going on with you. And so she's trying to maybe help suss out a direction for you. So what were you interested in before you joined up with the army? Well, before I mean before I lost the before the accident. I liked art, I liked photography, but this isn't uh, I don't know. I was kind of yeah, photography was my big thing. I don't know. It's just it's what I like to do. And I think I think uh, William at this point through like like a mouthful of French fry kind of looks over and he goes, "Have you ever thought about being a newspaper law photographer? I mean, I'm sure you could go into some pretty dangerous places uh, that, that a lot of people couldn't, right?" You got a point. I just it would be a waste of all this to stay off the field. I feel like I would be on the wrong side of the camera at that point. Uh, and Lady Goliath kind of shrugs. Uh, well, well, you know, Roger, that's that's ultimately up to you. Uh, wherever you feel most comfortable. Like, if you're comfortable and uh, if you feel like you're really making a difference punching bad guys in the face, then, I mean, who am I to say no, right? But if you're not being fulfilled doing that, then do what makes you happy, right? Yeah, it's just something I haven't put a whole lot of thought into. And he reaches over and takes a big drink out of William's milkshake to stall for time. He doesn't really know what to say, so he's just drinking to pass the time, basically. <laughs> I think William does that thing where he, like, like leans his shoulder into you and gives you, like, a little shove with it, like, you know, very affectionate, but, like, you jerk kind of motion. And at that point, you hear another voice from behind you, and this is a familiar one, who says, Yeah, you should really rethink what you want to do with your life. And you turn around, and this is plain clothes Axiom, who just slides into the seat next to Lady Goliath. And kind of like rubs the back of his head and goes, hey, uh, sorry about how that went last night. I was not in a great place. I talked to LG and we came to an agreement. And either way, I shouldn't have talked to you the way that I did. You're definitely an established hero. You're a better person than that. You didn't deserve that. And I think what he's doing is actually shifting your labels. He is shifting your superior up and your danger down you are an established hero you are smart you make good calls you're not a danger well i can't do either of those without <laughs> marking a condition so i better go ahead and roll to reject <laughs> well go ahead and try to reject that influence that is an eight okay all right uh so you can choose one off that list you want to uh, clear a condition or mark potential by immediately acting to prove them wrong uh shift a label up and down or cancel their influence and take plus one forward against them do you no longer care what axiom thinks about you yep i'm gonna take influence from axiom nice uh so how does that read on the page i think we get like as axiom slides into the booth we get the world's largest eye roll from infantry and then as he's talking, Infantry's eyes just sort of narrow a little more each panel. <laughs> With all due respect, I... I know who I am. And I appreciate what you're saying, but I'm not a big fan of you telling me I need to rethink what I'm doing with my life. I think that panel we definitely see Axiom realizes that he done stepped in it. And it's a very tense sort of moment there. And at that point, I actually want to move on over to Eliza. So, after the authorities showed up... Uh, they realized that they couldn't move this thing, and so they have roped off basically the entirety of Simone Park because they don't know what the hell it is. At this point, most of the circus folk are staying in temporary quarters outside, and obviously future shows for the moment are on hold. So the question is, Eliza, what have you been doing with your time? Uh, I mentioned Eliza also does some some crime fighting along with some of the other younger members of the circus. So I think that's sort of been what they've been prioritizing, is just sort of keeping the area around the park safe, because obviously there's a lot of, like, rubberneckers, and things can get a little chaotic when there's that many people around. So just making sure that everybody sort of stays stays safe. Okay, uh, so, you're, so you're out one evening sort of, you know, patrolling as you do. Uh, you've probably, you know, foiled some minor perch, uh, bleh, some minor purse snatchings and some, you know, uh, petty vandalism. Are you like just down on street level or are you doing like a Batman thing where you're up on the rooftops and acrobatics in your way across? Um, excuse me. Would I ever do anything that wasn't over the top and extra? <laughs> that's, that's why I was asking. <laughs> 
the ground walking I, on the I, ground I, I just wanted i just wanted to establish right where you're at r.i.p to pedestrians but i'm different right okay so you're up on a rooftop and you are making your way across uh when you see a couple of figures down in the alleyway below you and you take a look down there and you actually recognize one of these it's vivian and Furness, and a strapping young feller in a very uh, fancy fancy outfit and they appear to be mildly canoodling <gasps> well, if there's one thing that Eliza loves, it's the circus. But if there's another <laughs> thing that Eliza loves, it's the hot goss. So Eliza is going to kind of like shimmy down a drain pipe to, to get closer where she can listen. And actually, I could roll straight up creeping since that's literally what I'm doing. Well, I'm glad you're back. being honest about yourself. Uh, honesty is important. Um, which lets me lets me roll um, to scope out a person or place. Sure, yeah, go for it. Okay, that is a fourteen. So I am going to. Can I ask like who or what here is not what they seem to sort of figure out like what's the deal with this guy? You absolutely can, and I think the way that that plays out. So you're kind of like staying out of sight and just sort of like basically creeping, right? Yeah, I'm I'm straight up creeping. Have you shimmied down to like ground level at this point? Or are you just like... Um, No, I'm not at ground level. Okay, so like on like a fire escape above, maybe? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, cool. Uh, So you can kind of hear them talking a little bit. And first off, you get a better look at this guy. He is very broad, uh, very like muscular, very, very built. He's wearing a pea coat, like a nice big overcoat and a little top hat. He looks very fancy. Looks like he just came from like maybe like an opera or, you know, like a a fancy theater play. And Vivian is asking him... Are you sure this is going to work? Are you sure that like, can I, can I really? And she like leans into him and like looks up at him with like this big doe eyes. Can I really trust you? And he like kind of like leans down and puts like a little, a little kiss on her forehead. And he goes, if you can't trust me, you can't trust anything. And then he turns and he looks up at the sky where we see a full moon. And then he howls and then he turns into a freaking werewolf. What? (laughs) What the fuck? Um um, technically I get another question. You do, so go for it. <laughs> can, can I ask what's my best way out? <laughs> they don't seem to have noticed that you're here, so you could, in theory, just, like, head back up this fire escape. <laughs> she just starts whistling and walks away. <laughs> you know, I didn't, I did ask how I could get out, but I'm gonna yes and okay. this situation. So... I am literally going to drop and just be drop drop to to street level uh, and and land with a flourish and and go. Oh my goodness, you're a werewolf! Uh, and he like snaps his back, uh, his his eyes back to look at you, and then looks over at Vivian, and li- Vivian looks at him, and then looks at you, and then they both kind of try and like play it cool, like they weren't just you know kind of making out in an alleyway. Vivian sort of like puts her hand like over her heart and goes, <gasps> "A werewolf." <laughs> Oh, oh, Viv, don't do this to me. You think I didn't see what's going on. And honestly, you know, you're, you're doing pretty well for yourself, Viv. And, and she... A werewolf? And, and he kind of like... And he looks like very um embarrassed that, that you saw him like this. Uh, oh. And like, like sort of like turns and like starts casually, but not really sauntering down towards the end of the alleyway, just like sidling away. Uh, <laughs> uh, hey, uh, hey, uh, uh, Mr. Werewolf, um... Uh, you don't know me. I, I'm I'm Eliza Highwire. I love your work turning into a giant wolf. Um, I'm the star of the circus. Well, you know, Viv Viv is the other star of the circus, but I'm I'm the star of the circus. Viv's great though. Uh, we're we're best friends. Um, and so so what's going on? Vivian just kind of like puts a hand out on your shoulder and kind of like wa- waves at him, and she goes, it, "It's it's okay, Derek. I'll see you later. Just." I understand. And he like nods at her and then like drops down to all fours and like sprints towards the end of the alleyway. And Vivian is like blushing just furiously at this point. Bashful! Oh! Viv, Viv, don't be embarrassed. This is wonderful. Your boyfriend is a werewolf. She kind of like clears her throat a little bit. Eliza, that I, I, I'm honestly a little bit embarrassed that you saw that. I was going to introduce you to Derek. At some point, eventually, we just, we didn't know if we wanted to yet or not. Um, and she kind of like looks over at you and she goes, don't, 
don't tell the great man Jafuga. And don't tell my dad. He would never approve. All right. Uh, I will absolutely keep this a secret, but I just want you to know there's nothing to be ashamed about. Love is great, Viv. Love is great. And hey, at least at least one of us got got a, a handsome a handsome super powered boyfriend this week. And and she kind of looks over at you and like, what do you mean? I thought you were hitting it off with that silence character. <sighs> Viv, sometimes my wonderful, amazing skills, talents, beauty just goes unappreciated. And she kind of nods, and uh, and I think I like that panel of the two of you like heading out towards the other end of the alleyway, and she goes, Yeah, lots of things are unappreciated that really shouldn't be, like the love between an acrobat and a werewolf. And I want to get one more uh, very quick uh, scene with infantry. So this is very late at night. Uh, this is the evening before the opening of a particular gallery featuring the Walter Gibson collection. And Cleo has been uh, asked by Walter Gibson, whose collection it is, to keep an eye on things because this is a very expensive very one of a piece kind of exhibit uh specifically there is a third century uh hydraulic timepiece called the byzantium clock that has had several threats made on it at this point and so uh lady goliath has kind of offered uh herself and yourself to maybe keep an eye on the uh on the collection's opening tomorrow but that's all tomorrow this is tonight tell me about where you stay at night I think Infantry, to use the S word again, has a fairly simple apartment. He's sort of on the older side for a Masks character. I kind of like to imagine since he's a Cleo operative, they either pay him and then he either uses that money for a very simple little one-bedroom apartment, or maybe they just rent it for him directly. Okay. It's not in, like, the slums or anything, but it's, you know, like a simple little starter apartment. He doesn't really need a whole lot. He's not there very often anyway. So, you're just winding down. You're just getting ready to maybe turn in for the night. It's probably, like, 10, 11 o'clock at night at this point. And you're alone in your apartment, and you hear from the kitchen uh, area, you hear this uh, very faint but very pointed pop. And then uh, the lights come on, and you can hear someone sort of rustling around in your kitchen. What do you do? I think we get a panel of, like, the circuitry on his enhanced limbs lighting up, showing that he is bracing himself for the worst-case scenario. He's going to sort of, like, press his back to the wall on the outside of the kitchen and try to, like, peer around the corner without being seen, hopefully. Sure. Uh, You peer around the corner, and there is a... uh... There's a person in your kitchen that you've seen fairly recently. Professor Paradox is poking around your refrigerator. <laughs> and he is wearing a charcoal gray two-piece uh, suit with a very elegant bow tie. And uh, as you kind of peer around the corner, uh, he is holding a bouquet of uh, very light blue silk roses, which he places in a little uh, a vase on your countertop. And he's just sort of like humming the wedding theme to himself. And as he comes back out of your fridge, you see that he has gotten himself a glass of orange juice. Uh, So what do you do at this point? (laughs) I'm going to stand sort of into the doorway, half blocking that and half sort of announcing my presence. He's going to look at him and say, I appreciate the flowers, sir, but I'm afraid I'm already spoken for. And he looks over at you and he goes, Ah, well, you should appreciate them. You picked them out. I just came from your wedding. Takes a slow drink of the orange juice. (laughs) I believe you're confused. No, you're confused. I'm a time traveler. I found the two to not be mutually exclusive. I was in the future, crashing your wedding. Just now, actually. It's going to be a beautiful affair. You and William make a great couple. There is a panel where I think Infantry doesn't know how to react. And we get a close-up panel on his face after that, where he's just got this confused, but sort of contemplative look on his face. And I think that's the the, the moment that Paradox takes, and he puts the uh, the glass of orange juice on the countertop. And he kind of walks up, and he just, like, puts a hand on your shoulder. Listen, Roger, your vows are beautiful. I would hate to have to crash your wedding more than I already have. Now, currently, one version of me is dead, one version of me is... 
Eh, somewhere in this town, but this version of me is making you an offer. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to steal the Byzantium clock one way or the other. And, key for you, I can make all your dreams come true if you just stand aside. And he kind of like claps, his, uh, claps your shoulder again. Think about it, boy. Think about it. And then he pulls a wristwatch out of his, uh, out of his vest, clicks the top, and there's a soft pop. And you are left alone in your kitchen with a vase of blue silk flowers. Masks A New Generation is written for Magpie Games by Brendan Conway. It is made of plenty rugged pills, patsies, and pallies, all cute as a bug's ear in spandex. It's real kippy, so shake a leg and drop some lettuce on it, you pip. Infantry is played by Andy. You can find him and his many other projects on Twitter, at AndyLion92. The Silence, slash Norma Kelly, is played by Lee of the Rollout Podcast. You can find them on Twitter, at it's Ham Hawks. Eliza Highwire is played by Evan of the Rollout Podcast. You can find him on Twitter at Uncle Petunio. Lowdown is that Apex City is GM'd by Jeremy, which same scrub also writes the music and edits this podcast. Our album art was provided by Ash Brandt. Find them on Twitter at Cinder underscore Brandt, on Instagram at Brandt.ash, and on Tumblr at Kimmons. Find us on Stitcher, iTunes, Spotify, or whatever clip joint you prefer, Cinder Dick. Follow us on Twitter at Apex City Cast. Thank you for listening, and we'll dig you next issue.